have you with us today. So, um, my name is Susie Giles. I chair the um, CIPR ESG expert panel. We came together last year as a group of professionals working in the ESG space to uh, bring together our expertise and share that with the community. So as well as these events, this is the second of four events. We also are going to be bringing out some skills guides around the areas of ESG. So thanks so much for joining us. Um, also remember, this is worth five CPD points. And if you've seen um, the CIPR communications around the 75th anniversary target of meeting 75 CPD points by December, then you can use one of these as your five. Um, so I am going to hand over to uh, my lovely colleague, Quentin, who's joining us from New York, um, who's going to chair our discussion today. And uh, so thank you, Quentin. Uh, thank you, Susie. And oh, I've just had a shout out from our former student, Binu. Hi. Oh. Um, that's, uh, welcome, uh, everyone. We, uh, as Susie says, this is the, the, the second and today we are looking really at the role of the, the, the communicator. Um, so we're, uh, Matt, I think, has the slides. My role is as a journalist. I'm a journalist as well as a PR practitioner. So I will in particular be managing the question and answer session. I will be playing Jeremy Paxman <laughs> to make sure that everyone actually answers <laughs> the questions. Uh, so I think we are starting with Jihan, is that right? No. Oh, I'm hey. sorry. We're starting with Susie. <laughs> Welcome, Susie. I hand back to Susie as she talks through uh, the, uh, the opening part of the yeah. presentation. Thank you very slides, much. Slides coming up, slides coming up. Here we go. Right. Thank you, so, Matt. Wonderful. OK, so thank you. Hopefully, um, can you hear me, guys? Is my internet connection working at the moment? Seems OK, Susie, yeah. Um, OK, cool. Says your bandwidth, lo bandwidth is low, but it's all right. It seems to be quite clear. Um, Excellent. We'll, we'll give you a heads not, up in I case it drops. Turn off my camera. So um, thanks so much. Um, if you move on to the next slide, please, Matt. I will um, chat to you about the context for today. So. Thank you. So really what I want to just very briefly just um, talk to you about to, to kick us off on the discussion today is really understanding of what ESG means for the organizations that we're either working for or working with. And the important thing um, to, if you want to move on to the next slide, please, Matt, and the next one. Cool. So just to give you a little bit of background on me, I um, am an associate partner at Environmental Resources Management, so uh, which is a, a global sustainability consultancy. So I work in the ESG communication space. Um, so just um, thinking about what this means, what ESG means for our organisations today, I've... Um, Really, you know, the organizations I work with and my colleagues work with are really experiencing the impact of ESG in, in you know, a transformational way, um, especially um, at the moment. And many of you will have heard of the term ESG and, and very much connected with um, how organizations position themselves. Investment is just one piece of this ESG puzzle for organizations but it's an incredibly important piece because yes um, if you're trying to attract investment as an organization then your ESG position your performance and your ratings are important you'll know many of you that in the financial sector and in the banking sector um, there is definite uh, movement towards um, uh, more funding and specific funding around more sustainable practices. So organizations are really having to take notice of the impact that this has. But I think what's incredibly important is that ESG has become so much more widely known by such a wide group of your stakeholders that it's not really just about the investment. It's actually about how the company behaves, how the company performs. And today, making that shift, as many organizations are, 
to understanding what it means to operate um, to in, a, in an ESG um, environment is really impacting organizations from a change point of view. So it, it really does mean a change in the way an organization may operate. It may be a change in way in the way that we measure our performance. It could be small change initially, but for many organizations who are heading towards net zero and on that decarbonization journey, it really is a fundamental change often in the way they operate. And so that as communicators, has a huge impact for us. And importantly, it's not just about what we say externally to our stakeholders, but it's incredibly important that we think about how we communicate this internally within our organizations. So the change that ESG is bringing about within organizations is in, important in a number of ways, but it really is important so that that your people in organizations understand the why um, of why this is happening and what needs to change and how important this is. And from a branding and communications point of view, it's also about organizations combining and understanding how do I talk about my business um, and my purpose and what we're about with this added element of what we're doing across our environmental and social and governance. And it's really about making sure that those things are one and the same. It's not about two separate narratives. It's about ESG being part of the way you operate as a business. And that is, is going to be something as you'll hear today from my colleagues that is going to become even more important with what is coming down the line as far as ESG regulation um, and frameworks are concerned. So, so just just to position it there, it's a, it's a period of change, it's exciting, and there's some great opportunities for us as communication professionals. So I'll hand back to you, Quentin and Jihan. Great, thank you, Susie. Uh, and uh, next slide, please, Matt. Um, uh, we're now moving forward to Jihan talking about the impact on business and communicators. So Jihan, if you could perhaps start just by telling us a few words about your background uh, and why you're qualified to be telling us these things. Thank you, Quentin. Hi, everyone. So as Quentin was saying, my name is Jihan Hyde and I am the CEO and founder of Communique. We are um, the ESG business model integration and communication advisory firm. But I'm also, besides being the founder of, of uh, Communique, I am the uh, CIPR uh, ESG communications course leader and designer. So if you ever do come into and join our um, courses within the CIPR, you'll see my beautiful face delivering the course for you. But also I'll be design I'm the one who designed it for you as well. We've just now about to launch our e-modules um aspect of esg comms uh, courses so please do go and check it out it will be a stepping stone uh, ahead of taking the actual course where you will meet me and then i'll take you through how would you design your esg communication strategy so that is me in a nutshell um uh next slide please matt so as Susie has kindly given us, she gave us the context about what, but, but what does that really mean? What is the impact that ESG really has on employees, on, on customers and on our investors? To give you some, some idea, in total, out of the 9 billion uh, people living in this planet, 3.5 of us are employees. So it's a huge chunk that we need to pay attention to. And in my opinion, employees are key for your ESG commitment, and especially if you want them to help you with collecting the data, with living and breathing your DNA and changing your culture to reflect your ESG commitment. So according to the data, and I do love my data, I must admit, so please excuse me if my slides will be filled with data, but um, my data basically, according to PwC, when they've, uh, when they have surveyed around 10,000 uh, individuals, the majority of 70% of the Gen Zers have said that they were more likely to join you if you have strong green footprint 
and you're actually talking about it. 86% of the young talent also prefer working for you um, if their values and, or if the issues that you're solving as an organization aligns to what is close to their heart. 14% actually has been th uh, found, so 14% so out of the majority, the surveyed organizations was, was proven that they had the biggest and the largest um, employee satisfaction. So they were 14% higher than their peers. And 30% of our current employees are now leaving us because we do not have a clear corporate agenda. And we've seen this with, with the Me Too, Me Too movement, with the great resignation. So ESG is huge, but also we need to embed it within the employee's mindset. So we have to then, we have to communicate it clearly. Uh, next slide, please, Matt. When it comes to customers, customers are bread and butter. We have to, we, I mean, this is our livelihood. We need to, we need to bring them on board. And we've seen how companies, shareholders completely dip because customers have been calling them out for not saving our people or not even talking about the planet. So, um, PwC again, along with Deloitte and several others. So these data are coming from across several um, sources. But 76% of consumers say that they will stop buying from you if you don't treat the environment well, if you don't treat your employees or the community properly. Um, and in the UK, for example, one in three of our consumers have said they will, they'll be happy to buy products that are sustainable. 88% of our consumers said they'll be more loyal to us as, as whether it's a service, whether it's, um, it's a product if we support societal and environmental issues. 38% of our consumers have also said they'll boycott us if we don't align with their values and we don't highlight how we're you know, uh, saving people on planet. But for me, the biggest impact is the 98% of the consumers who were surveyed in the UK, in Europe, and in the Middle East said that they want organizations to start thinking seriously and addressing societal issues. Next slide, please. Investors. I know we don't really think much from a communications point of view about investment unless you're in, a, um, in an investor relation team, but investors are key. We have to keep them happy. They control our growth, and especially if you're a small company. So to give you some context, 75% of organizations in the UK are small to medium enterprises. In other words, they do live on investors, some of them anyways. Um, so if we look at the investors, investors had the opportunity during the pandemic to really sit back and reflect on their portfolios and then identify which portfolios are more, um, are more uh, which portfolios are more profitable than the others. And as a result, coming out of the uh, out of the uh, pandemic, eighty four, according to Forbes magazine, eighty four percent of investors and asset owners are now looking at ESG when deciding where to invest. And interestingly, female from ethnic minority are actually looking deeply into that as well. It's not here, but I can always provide you with that report. $77 billion of asset under management funds have now rebranded themselves into sustainable funds. 85% of asset managers say that ESG is a high priority for their companies. $35 trillion of ESG mandated assets could make up half of the investments by 2025. So just to put this into context, 35 trillion that's a number. The GDP of the US is only 22 trillion. So can you imagine the enormity of how ESG is now really going to dominate what investors look for when they're investment, investing into a portfolio or company? But the only challenge that investors do face at this moment of time is the lack of standardization when they're, report, when they're looking at an ESG performance of a company. And this is Matt 
uh, we'll be talking more about that. But the, the problem we're having as investors is that when we're looking to invest into a company, we are actually comparing apple to oranges and not oranges to oranges. And there's a huge problem at the moment. But that does not mean that this data is not shouting the fact that investors are going to keep us accountable and hold us accountable for our ESG commitment as an organization. Next slide, please, ma'am. So we've spoken about the impact of ESG on businesses. So what is the impact on us as communication professionals? Because of the lack of standardized data, we will face three problems or three challenges that we really need to look into very carefully. Greenwashing, green hushing, and misinformation. Greenwashing, for those of you who are new to this term, is basically when an organization makes um, and when you when it makes you believe that they're doing something related to the environment that in reality that they're not so to give you an example ryanair last year their advertisement were pulled down by the um, advertising standard association why because they claim that their carbon footprint is going to be less than their peers which in reality wasn't true because the data they provided the asa and the cma were from data from 2019. So that's where greenwashing is when you're absolutely lying or not telling us the truth about your commitment or hiding parts of your environmental commitment. Green hushing is the opposite. Green hushing, um, what, what, they, what, what it means is that if you're an organization and you're doing amazing work in the, in the environmental social aspect of ESG, but you're not talking about it. You've chosen to be radio silent about it. Why? Because you are afraid to be scrutinized by your, uh, the regulators, not regulators, sorry, by the customers or by your employees or by society in general. The danger of green hushing here for us as communication professionals is that we'll be alienating as a result our customers and our employees because they are the largest assets and the biggest advocates that we will have. So that's the danger of green hushing. Misinformation, I'm not going to go dive deep into it because this will actually be uh, talked about and discussed uh, in a more detail in, our, in the next session by our colleagues. But misinformation is that it's basically when we are reading or we are hearing information that's not true. It's very different and don't confuse it with green washing. Misinformation is not greenwashing. Misinformation is the information, uh, normally it's the overarching umbrella of societal and environmental claims. Greenwashing, normally it's purely environmental claims, normally. To give you an example, Nissan. Nissan to, uh, last year, um, we, uh, we, uh, last year basically what they did is that they've claimed that their electrical cars will go further or they they misclaimed the range of their electrical cars because of this misinformation that was given to us as consumers our purchase power our purchase decision was made according to this wrong information and that's the difference between misinformation and greenwashing and these are the three dangers or these are the three impacts that we really need to focus on as communication professionals and the only way we need to we will be able to get uh we will be able to overcome these uh challenges is by upskilling ourselves and by challenging the data that we what that we receive before we communicate it and that's my part and now i hand back to quentin thank you very much Brilliant, Jihan. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad that you broke that down between the impact on customers, uh, investors and employees. I, I've long made the case in my role as a, an academic, I, I have several hats, um, that it's actually the long term partners of an organization such as employees and investors that will look in more detail uh, at ESG than customers do. Customers are often very <laughs> transactional in their decision making. I'm also really glad that you mixed in their data from what people say they're going to do and actual observations of what people are doing. Uh, it's very easy to say you're committed 
uh, to environmental issues. But if people are actually quitting their jobs, uh, then that's an action and that's a proof point. Uh, that's much that that that's far beyond merely saying that this is something uh, important to you. So next we're moving on to the the regulatory environment, and Matt is going to talk about that. Uh, so Matt, again, uh, if you can introduce yourself and talk about why you are qualified uh, to share this this information with us. Well, I'll, I'll allow the audience to judge um, whether I'm qualified or not after after I've spoken. But um, uh, hello, everyone. My <laughs> name is Matt Peacock. I'm a senior partner at Blurred. If you don't know Blurred, we are a strategic and creative advisory firm focused on ESG and purpose. Um, almost all of our work is with multinational corporations and large corporates uh, working on the most complex and demanding sets of ESG risks imaginable. Um, and we also work with uh, the same organizations on their narrative, because one of the themes that uh, will underline in these sessions is that ESG isn't simply about data. ESG is also about storytelling. It's also about narrative. It's also about the proposition that you present to the world. And, and at Blurred, we do both the analytics and we do the narrative together. Well, that's uh, why you're qualified. Well, there you go. Well, I haven't said anything yet, but thank you all the same. Um, uh, my personal background is 25 years in multinational life, uh, almost all of which is in-house combination of telecoms and tech sector, oil and gas industry and regulation. Um, as uh, my most recent role was I was being corporate affairs director at Vodafone for John Blood. So that's me. Right. So uh, what lies ahead? Um, um, what lies ahead is a radically new landscape for ESG, right, with significant consequences for communicators. And the next three to four years are going to be pretty tumultuous for, for all of us. Um, some of the biggest changes in public disclosure relate to climate risks. So the UK is actually a global pioneer here because the UK government has taken the voluntary climate risk reporting framework created by this thing called the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, known as TCFD for short, and the government has turned it into hard law. So if you don't know TCFD, TCFD requires companies to publish data on their most material risks arising from the physical consequences of climate change. So extreme weather events, drought, flooding, wildfires and so forth, but also the associated transition risks. So the costs of switching to zero carbon energy sources, for example. Now, the point here is that TCFD requires companies to assess and disclose types of risk that in many cases may have never appeared in the public risk register before. So if a company has a particular exposure to severe flooding, or if the costs of decarbonizing its operations will be enormous, and it hasn't told its investors and other stakeholders about those risks previously, to Jihan's point earlier, this disclosure will be hugely consequential. Another potential development is in the US. So the US is typically around five to 10 years behind Europe on most ESG topics. The SEC in the US is proposing the introduction of mandatory disclosure on a company's emissions impacts and the extent to which climate change threatens a company's value chain. Companies would also be required to set out in detail how they'll transition to net zero. Now, the really big change here would be a requirement that US listed companies, some of the biggest companies in the world by value, put a dollar number next to their climate risk exposure. In other words, they need to tell their investors how much value would be destroyed under a worst case scenario in a much warmer world. And that is a really big deal. Another big change is in the accounting world. Now, this bit's a bit geeky uh, and I'll be swift. Bear with me, but it is important, I promise. OK, so the short version is the professional body that oversees financial reporting standards worldwide has merged with the main global sustainability accounting body to create this new thing called the ISSB, the International Sustainability Standards Board. Now, what that means is that over time, how companies report on sustainability will need to be as precise and carefully considered as their reporting of financial information, because ESG data and financial data will be assessed externally with an equal level of rigor within a consistent globally applied framework. So the super short version is forget CSR fluff, forget greenwash bollocks, and forget vague nonsense with kind of stock photos of rainforests in your sustainability report. This is a whole new world of sustainability reporting ahead. 
Now, there's another big change. And the headline here is that if you think the E of ESG is only about climate change and greenhouse gas emissions, then you need to think again, because humanity is facing two existential crises, not one. The climate crisis that we all know about, but also a biodiversity crisis. And that is why we have another acronym, I'm afraid, the Task Force on Nature Related Financial Disclosures, or TNFD for short. And this has been convened by a group of the world's largest institutional investors. In fact, many of the same people who created TCFD, the climate version, the same thing, all of whom have realized that the rapid destruction of ecosystems on land, in our rivers and in the oceans, puts trillions of dollars of value at risk. So in simple terms, if you're an asset manager with a large shareholding in a food production company whose major crops face irreversible die off as a result of ecosystem collapse, then to put it mildly, you have a profound and acute interest in biodiversity matters. Now, this is, I have to tell you, a coldly capitalist way of looking at one of the main threats to the future of the human race. But frankly, from my perspective, if following the money means driving companies to do the right thing faster, wider and deeper, then frankly, all good. Now, all of these are significant developments, but the really, really big change, the one that will directly or indirectly affect everyone on this call at some point in your careers, is what's coming next in the EU. Because there are two new EU directives ahead that collectively represent the most demanding new regulations I've ever seen in my career. And I say this, by the way, as a former regulator, I was part of the leadership team that established Ofcom in the UK. So the first is the new EU Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, the CSRD, which sets out a new disclosure framework called the European Sustainability Reporting Standards, or ESRS. Apologies for all the acronyms. All you need to remember is reporting standards, the new reporting standards. Now, these new reporting standards will be mandatory, and they are remarkably detailed and prescriptive. They have 84 separate disclosure areas and they require more than 1,100 quantitative data points, and all of those disclosures will need to be externally audited. Any company with EU subsidiaries above a specific turnover threshold will have to report at the individual entity level in each separate EU member state under these new rules annually. That includes UK and US multinationals with an EU presence, and eventually the standards will be mandatory for more than 50,000 private and public companies across the EU. That is a colossal increase in disclosure, and it will lead to a vast amount of data in the public domain, including data that for some companies, and actually potentially for many companies, will be difficult to explain and highly controversial. Right, so these new EU reporting standards aren't actually the biggest challenge, though. Uh, there is a second directive ahead that is even tougher, and that is the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive. Now, this beast is still in draft form, and there's quite a fierce debate underway right now in Brussels about what should or should not be included. So we don't yet have the final version. But what we know so far is this. The Due Diligence Directive will require companies to prove that they are able to mitigate actual and potential environmental and human rights harms in order to operate. The obligation to prove this spans the most important parts of the company's global value chain from its own workforce and suppliers through to its business partners and its business customers. Unlike the CSRD, these are not simply transparency rules. The draft directive is deliberately designed to compel companies to look hard at how they operate and in some areas potentially make radical changes if they cannot prove that they're able to prevent or mitigate negative environmental or human rights impacts. If the company cannot prove it can mitigate the most severe risks, it would ultimately be required in law to terminate or exit the activity involved. And that is enormously significant. So think about a company's critical suppliers in a low income country with a poor human rights record. How can a company prove it can mitigate severe human rights impacts in a country like that? I can tell you from my own personal experience, because I've worked in this field for a very long time, the reality is it can't. And that would mean under the directive that those suppliers and that country would be effectively off limits. It doesn't matter how important the suppliers are, 
And it doesn't matter how big and important the country is. Now, I hope you're staying with me up to this point, because if nothing else, please remember this. This isn't simply a reporting challenge. It goes way beyond a bunch of paperwork to be handled by compliance and financial reporting teams. These new rules will force many companies to ask difficult questions about their core business strategy. And that's exactly what the EU policymakers and institutions had in mind when they drafted these rules. For them, that is the whole point of the exercise. And please don't think of this as a purely European challenge. These rules have been designed to capture companies from anywhere in the world that have an EU presence. And the disclosures required span each company's total global value chain, not just its activities in the EU. This is a very deliberate and considered endeavour over more than a decade, actually, by the EU institutions to establish what could, in effect, become the new global ESG framework. One last point to think about here before I hand you back to Quentin. Why? Why is this happening? Why are the EU institutions unleashing this great wave of new obligations on more than 50,000 companies? Well, here is a random selection of companies and brands that have found themselves accused of causing severe environmental or human rights harm in recent years. Now, if you work for one of the companies on this slide, please do not feel picked on. It is a random list. And if your company is not on this slide, but should be, please do not feel exonerated. The large majority of the companies on this slide and many, many, many others beyond them are signatories to the UN Global Compact. Many of these companies and others like them claim to respect international labor organization principles governing how the workforce should be treated. Quite a lot of them state their support for the UN guiding principles on business and human rights or the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. And the point about all those frameworks and principles I've just mentioned is they all contain good and honorable language setting out how companies should respect people and planet. And that language duly appears on many, many companies' websites and in their annual reports and sustainability reports. The policymakers love those frameworks and principles. In fact, they've actually copied a lot of the language from them in these new, new laws. But they are deeply unimpressed that companies have made a bunch of promises to do the right thing by planet and people that we in the corporate world did not keep. We promised, but we didn't deliver. So as a result, what was voluntary is now mandatory. This is payback for years of corporate bluster and greenwash. And with that, back to Quentin. OK, thank you, uh, Matt. A um, couple of very interesting learning points there. Uh, the, the, the thing that struck me is that it seems as though organizations are going to have to choose between doing business in Europe and doing business with, say, China uh, or the Middle East or Russia, because they obviously cannot guarantee that there will be no human rights abuses in China or the Middle East uh, or Russia uh, and will not be permitted to do business in the EU without making those guarantees. So um, I am hoping that there will be at least some rethinking of that process before that is uh, adopted in law. Uh, another thing that struck me, um, you talked about 84 areas. This is a moving target. And if, if I'm recalling correctly, that number is actually slightly higher than it was when you first mentioned it, when we were- No, it's lower. It's to... actually lower. <laughs> it's come it's down, down, has it? Oh, it's come right. down, yeah. The, the original, it was, it was 2,200 quantitative data points. It's halved. Right, okay. I was thinking of the 84 areas. I thought that- Yeah, no, that, there was over 150 in the original version. Wow. So uh, these things are moving rapidly um, just within the past few months. Those, some of those figures have changed. Yeah. Uh, and these are for laws that are being phased in over the next couple of years. Mm. So this is not the, the thing people are discussing, maybe adopting in 2026. Mm. These are <coughs> things that are starting to come in uh, from next year. Correct. So we have a, um, a, a huge 
change on the horizon. And we don't even know all of the details yet about what's happening next year. So that's, that's right. a, an enormous challenge uh, for all of us. We've had a few questions coming in on the chat already. Uh, Lindsay raised the question about the cost of living implications. I see this, I, I'm not entirely sure what she was getting at, but I, I, I have observed over many years that there are two uh, aspects to this. One is that when people are worried about inflation or unemployment, they're looking for a job, that becomes their, their first priority. Um, worrying about the long-term implications of climate change is something you do when you're a little bit more comfortable and necessarily um, you know, uh, environmental concerns go up and down the political agenda uh, according to how comfortable people are with other things. The other aspect, of course, is that making these changes is going to be expensive and therefore uh, uh, making the changes will itself have an impact on the cost of living. Uh, I yeah. wonder if, if Matt I ask, or Jihan... Yeah. Oh, yes, please. <clears throat> Can I add something, Quentin? Okay, so the cost of living, has it affected the consumers and the way they buy the sustainable products? It did. There's no doubt. Okay. Mm -hmm. But what it also happened, because of the war and because of what's all the crisis that's happening around us, it also accelerated the actions that companies are taking when it comes to renewable energy. So they're now, the actual companies are now looking on how would they increase their efficiency and reduce their operational costs. So they realize that the quickest and, the, and it, at the beginning is going to be expensive, but then on the long run, it will, it will actually be profitable, is to look into renewable energy, is to look into the well-being of employees, is to look into um, into helping them and, and, and gaining their, their loyalty. So to summarize, yes, it has from a consumer point of view, but it did not affect much the organizations and their acceleration to, uh, to become sustainable. Okay, great. Matt, did you want to elaborate on that? Um, can you come back to me in a second? Sorry, because I just sure, I, no lost, problem. I lost the audio for about 45 okay. seconds. Okay. <laughs> Um, though, though another a question from Jill T uh, was a, a, a factual one, uh, I think aimed at you, Matt, about um, the ESRS and what the turnover threshold will be, if you recall that off the top of your head. Yeah, I, I, actually, I just slightly cheekily popped into the chat as well. It's 150 million euros, um, uh, right. which doesn't, which sounds like a lot, but mm. a, a surprisingly large number of companies it captures. Yeah. Um, yeah. The that's in the first wave. The th the turnover threshold is lower later. Um, once you get down to fifty thousand companies, um, e essentially you're capturing the larger end of small and medium enterprises. Uh, from memory, I think it's forty million turnover threshold in the second wave. But the first wave is one yeah. fifty. So th this at the moment is mm -hmm. only targeting businesses. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so public and private, though. So right. uh, the first wave not just, are yeah, EU domiciled okay. public companies, and then the second wave will be, um, uh, for example, the EU sub subsidiaries of an American multinational, um, right. or a large privately owned company. They're caught in the second wave, and then as it expands, it goes down into into smaller medium enterprises. Obviously, we have a lot of CIPR members who uh, work in the voluntary sector or in the, the government uh, sector, work at the NHS for um, uh, local authorities, that sort of thing. They aren't covered by this, as I understand it. But it does seem to me that if this becomes an expectation people have from their businesses, then they're going to say, well, if I get this information from Shell, why don't I get it from Camden Council? Yeah. Um, and, and other organizations are effectively going to be forced to follow along with this. Yeah, I agree completely. So it, it is very much focused on, as I say, corporate payback. That's that's my my sort of shorthand version of it. Um, uh, payback both from investors uh, and from institute and from uh, policy institutions, to be clear, because the the investor frameworks like TCFD, the climate related risk um, um, disclosures I'm talking about, really arose because investors were 
increasingly concerned that companies were not telling them the truth about the extent to which companies would be affected by flooding and tornadoes and wildfires and so forth. Um, so you've got this sort of con combined effect of uh, the the owners of companies, institutional investors are the owners of companies, becoming increasingly aware that ESG represents a material threat to value and, and increasingly concerned that companies are not providing good enough data about this, which is a point that Susie made earlier and Jihan also touched on this. The data isn't good enough for investors to make informed decisions. And then on the other side, you've got the policymakers who, certainly in the European context, you know, represent the citizens of Europe who are enormously frustrated with, you know, to be blunt, the bullshit, the corporate bullshit, the, the, the fact that companies say they're doing the right things and yet consistently don't do the right things. Um, and they've had enough. They've had enough. And you've got that kind of combined pincer movement from the, you know, the shareholders and the policymakers converging on companies to bring about, as I say, what, what is, I think, is a once in a generation change in the level of disclosure required. But to your point, Quentin, logically, once the public start to see this unimaginable um, amount of data coming out of companies because they have to by law, they are going to turn around and say, well, actually, my local authority is a billion pound enterprise in its own right. And I haven't got a clue what they're doing in all the areas where companies are reporting. So so my strong instinct, and I'd be interested in others' views on the panel, but my strong instinct is that this will morph into all sectors, including the third sector, actually, over time. And the corporates are the first because, frankly, corporates probably deserve it the most, but they're not the last. Well, I'm yeah, not and Sorry, Quentin, I've, uh, if I may, sorry. Uh, when it comes to the public authority, so for example, in the UK, there's 231 councils and they are all operating in silos. No one is, and they all have their own budgets, as we all know. Yeah. Now the UK has announced that there are two, 2050 uh, um, uh, uh, target carbon cut target is now going is going to be moved forward because they they're not going to reach it so what do we do other than other than just you know the businesses have to force the government to act and it's always been the case governments don't act unless there's pressurized from businesses mm -hmm. i i think that's right and uh you you can see that in fact the people who are uh cynical about the government's climate change agenda are pointing to the fact that the government will say, uh, in the UK context, they will say that uh, they're expecting um, yeah, massive flooding and yet is not investing in flood defences. Yeah. But uh, over here where I am, New York is, the, the city is saying, and the state they're saying that they expect uh, massive flooding of lowland areas. And yet New York City is selling bonds secured against assets that it owns which it it says are likely to be flooded <laughs> within the next few decades yep. um so this is absolutely happening within the government sector as well uh and people are going to point out the hypocrisy of government saying you have to disclose um you know a to z or a to z as i should be obliged to say now that i live in the uh, uh, the us uh, and you're not disclosing this same material data uh, yourselves. So, so you, yeah. Sorry, so, sorry. Yeah. Uh, there is actually there is the, the pressures that's happening at the moment from the businesses is that there is uh, there is a new bill coming out. It's called the Better Business Act, and it's been signed by a thousand businesses in the UK, and they're forcing a uh, the um, there is an Article seventy one which says uh, it talks about profit but it doesn't talk about people on planet ahead of profit. So now we're all campaigning, I'm part of the bill, uh, part of the movement is that we're, we're, we're talking to our MPs to convince the government to change just that statement to include people, planet, uh, sorry, planet, people, and then put profit at the end as mm -hmm. opposed to profit by itself. So pressures are gonna come, but we just don't know when will they come. Mm. Now, a couple of people have raised in the chat, uh, Alona as, as, as one of them, uh, and a couple of others have been commenting on B Corp certification. Yeah. 
Uh, and I was wondering what members of the panel had to say about that and whether that's um, a step in the right direction. Does it go far enough? That sort of thing. Well, Chi Han's the expert on that. Uh, well, Blurred is also B Corp as well, certified. Um, <laughs> listen, B Corp is not without its own issues, like you've mentioned, uh, with an espresso and brew dog. Okay, but who's perfect? You know, even the science-based targets, even GRI, even TCFD, they all have problems and the way they report and the data that they're gathering because there's assumptions that all the data that these reporting mechanism are gathering is for own benefit so that they force you to use them as their consultants to gather the data for you. The, the, the good thing about B Corp is that they've now with, uh, acknowledged that there is a problem and this is what we're now helping them. So we're a group of equitable growth uh, founders and we're coming in at the moment to advise B Corp on what would be the standards, uh, what would be the data gathered, how should it be you know, gathered, but most importantly, what should be gathered. So we're working on that, uh, but it's the one place actually where it's perfect for SMEs mm. because SMEs can't afford the big money. <clears throat> Yeah. But if you are from an ethnic minority or if you're, if you're a female founder, you actually get a huge discount when you do certify, be certified. But yes, I agree with you. B Corp is not perfect, but it's they're definitely to it. It's a stepping stone towards the right direction. Hence, mm -hmm. there is several, several organizations and several of my clients are now using the assessments of the B Corp uh, to start the journey ahead of being even thinking of being certified. Okay, great. Um, Paul has raised the point that we've talked a lot about environmental uh, mm. and climate issues. And although we we've, we've, have mentioned human rights, we haven't really explored in the same level of detail the S, the, the, the social uh, aspect of ESG. Now, uh, my understanding is that, <laughs> that that is not as fully fleshed out in law. So it, well, it is a bit vague. But it <laughs> It's, uh, it, it is the, the devastating point that I was raising earlier, uh, following on what Matt said, the uh, obviously a business based in Europe cannot guarantee that there will be no human rights abuses in China. Um, and so what is the path forward when they're being asked to prove that that um, uh, will be the case from now on. Just can I, just a quick one on that one, just to correct um, so, something that, that it's important for everyone to understand this. So the new reporting standards I talked about, ESRS, have vast amounts of disclosure obligations focused, focused on the S. Yeah. In fact, there's more on the S than there is on the E, in fact. Yeah. Um, and the S areas are some, going to be some of the most challenging. So that I, I, you know, I'm not going to go through all 84 topic areas because we'd be here for roughly a month. Um, <laughs> Uh, but even a headline version would take a week. Um, the the key the, the key thing that we highlight with our clients, that um, particularly US clients who don't really think like this, is the obligations around workforce well-being and workforce safety and workforce um, uh, freedom of association, which is the right to join a trade union and yeah. the right to collective bargaining. All of these things are specified in extraordinary depth in the ESRS. Uh, there's an entire section just on the workforce. There's an entire section focused on all aspects of societal impact in your supply chain. Yeah. Not just the fundamental human rights, but all aspects of mm -hmm. how the supply, the people in your supply chain should be treated. So, so I wouldn't want anyone to have the impression that what lies ahead is mainly focused on the E. Mm -hmm. There's a ton of stuff on the S, which actually in practice is the hardest stuff to get right. Mm. The S is the hardest to measure in many areas, human rights particularly. Um, it's the hardest to bring about change. It's the one that really will be driving supplier selection choices in the future. So it's exactly to your point, Quentin, about human rights in difficult parts of the world, mm. um, much more than any of the, the demands under the E. Yeah, so for the moment, it's disclosure uh, on the S. But uh, in the, the foreseeable future, there are plans to make Correct. it enforceable. Correct. And that, uh, that changes yeah. uh, everything. And um, 
we're then in the invidious position of saying to people uh, in China, uh, you don't have any human rights. You now also don't have any trade yeah, uh, or any business or any jobs. So, so this, uh, is, this, is, um, th this, in, in, this is a cynical view for me, but what the hell have been around a long time. Uh, <laughs> this is a deliberately protectionist measure by the EU institutions. Yeah. This is about reshoring everything back into the EU. Um, and a large part of it, uh, on the part of many of the individuals involved in drafting this stuff, is a decoupling from China. Yes, and I think we were, obviously we're seeing that in the US political agenda as well. It's just same. a little bit more same. open. Yeah, um, it's the same. And the, uh, I, I, your slide earlier, you were talking about organizations that have been criticized. Um, I, I worked at Shell in the 1990s, I remember. But um, uh, you mentioned VW. Yep. Uh, that actually is a classic example. You said that often uh, the US is a little bit behind in environmental stuff compared with the EU. Um, on the term, uh, on uh, the matter of particulate emissions from diesel cars, uh, the US has vastly more exacting standards yeah. than yeah. the EU. And that's what VW was falling short of yeah. and fixing the figures around. But the basic reason that the US has these very demanding standards on uh, diesel cars is that uh, the, the big three in Detroit don't make diesel cars. Correct. <laughs> they wanted to lock it was, VW. It was, and other it, was green, it was green protectionism in the same yeah. way that the critics of the Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA in the US now, understandably, view it as green protectionism. I think the difference in Europe is that it's societal protectionism in a sense, it's kind of human rights protection, if you can call it that, rather than environmental protectionism. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yes. So um, let's see what else we've got coming up in the. Uh, well, the Quentin, I like yeah. Simon Montague's uh, question in the Q and A, um, oh, asking because okay, this is interesting. Thinking about how ESG is becoming a, a partisan issue in the US, and obviously you're sat in the US as well. But the fact, have we got any views on the? 18 US Republican governed states to restrict or ban investors in infrastructure from the states if they include ESG considerations as part of the investment decisions. I mean, I think this one is interesting. I know I've worked with quite a few financial clients over here in Europe and, and uh, those who signed up to the Net Zero Banking Alliance and, and there was a there were financiers in the US who were talking about let's pull out of that because it's become too restrictive and you know the 1.5 degree etc cetera, etc cetera. but it, it is it is interesting to see how you know some of the frameworks and regulations that are coming in may you know force force these things in the, in a different direction what you Jihan and Matt think well, didn't JP Morgan pull out as well recently? Was it JP Morgan or who was it? There was a couple of banks that pulled out, uh, asset investor, investment companies pulled out out of that uh, clay, out of that alliance because they just thought that the data and what's required of them and the regulation is just not unattainable. Yeah, it, it kind of, I mean, it's, yeah. quite a, it's, it, that, it's quite a complicated story what's happening with the Net Asset Owners Alliance. It's, it's not really driven by uh, explicitly by the Republican agenda in the US. No, there, it's not. It's no, not. It's, there, there are sort of complicated fiduciary duty uh, tensions yeah. uh, right. around it, uh, which uh, cannot easily be reconciled. Uh, I mean, uh, it's going to be interesting to see your views because, you know, you live, you live there and you live this stuff. But mm. just a quick view for me, if I may. Um, first of all, the, the, the Republican Party and the DeSantis um, uh, dimension to this uh, strikes me as largely performative ahead of the US elections. Um, so DeSantis has landed on woke, anti-woke as a theme, and it seems to play well with the Trump base, and he's just pushing all the buttons and various people are kind of rolling in um, behind. It, it is completely irrational, because at root, from a, fa from a financial institution perspective, ESG is about material risk management. And material risk management, so in other words, identifying threats to value that could destroy mm. the enterprise or destroy your investment and doing something about them, that is your bloody job as a director. And it doesn't matter what badge you put on a risk, you know, whether it's a hurricane or whether it's a bad debt or whether it's a competitor coming up with a better technology than you, a risk is a risk. 
And your fiduciary duty as a director is to take all risks into account. Um, so essentially uh, ruling a whole bunch of risks off limit because they have a particular label attached to them is madness and it's unsupportable. Um, but as I say, yeah. I don't think it's real. I think it's performative ahead of the election. Um, and I, I think that that's absolutely right. This is about performance. Um, and we, we've seen that with, there's been a long-standing argument in, in the US about the Citizens United case, which said that uh, businesses uh, have a right to free speech. And for decades, um, Democrats have been saying they're against that and Republicans have been saying that they're for that. And now the DeSantis is um, bringing retaliatory measures against Disney for criticizing his policies suddenly Republicans are against free speech for businesses and Democrats are now saying, but it's in the constitution. <laughs> and, um, yeah. So there's, yeah, uh, everyone is immediately flip-flopping uh, according to what is convenient at the moment. Binu, former student of mine and therefore an, oh, yes. an excellent and well-educated person has uh, <laughs> raised the, um, the question of the population explosion. We are still seeing rapid population rise uh, in South Asia uh, and uh, in the Middle East and Africa. Uh, we are also seeing wealthier countries, uh, the UK, the US, the EU, being much less willing to accept uh, immigration. So the, the rapid population growth is happening in some countries. People are denied the opportunity to move to countries where there are uh, better prospects. Uh, and many of the wealthier countries, and this is particularly the case uh, for Japan, South Korea, but with real risks, uh, growing risks in Central and Eastern Europe uh, in particular, uh, of an aging population where there won't necessarily be enough young people uh, in work to support the retired uh, population. So how does this population crisis, or the various population crises affecting different parts of the world differently, uh, how does this impact on ESG? Hmm. Right, Matt, you seem to be frozen. No, I was, I was, I was just I, thinking. I was thinking. <laughs> Deeply I just, thinking. Good. Yeah, Gian, Susie, why, why don't you go first? Because I've done quite a lot of the talking. So, the, if I understand the question, the question. Well, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, go yeah. on, Gian. No, no, go, go, go. No, I'm just saying it, 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 yeah, it is interesting. Aren't we in a position at the moment where there are fewer five year olds in the world and more people over the age? There are more people over the age of 60 than there are under the age of five. So, um, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting one. I mean, I suppose it also, I mean, it also looks at parts of the world and, and I think, um, you know, where those population explosions are um, and climate change and where those impacts are. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I'm just thinking, I don't know, Jihan. So, okay, so the increase, okay. What I know that will affect ESG is the rising age, the working yes. age. So the, the population, when the, we have a much larger, older population who we will do. be needing to work longer. Okay, so they will need upskilling, reskilling. So that will affect how you would look at your employees and how would you retain them and yes. how would you get them back yeah. to your company. The population, it depends on where is it exactly. So Quentin, you said that it was in Africa, Middle East and Asia. If the population is increasing and it's women who are, and the female population is increasing, that means, and the data is providing this and proving this, women are the most affected by climate change. So that means mm, we need to start thinking about how are we going to empower these ladies and us as females to tackle climate change. And especially in the rural areas where you're underbanked, you're not educated as a woman and you don't have access to resources. So that's again going to affect how you operate as an organization. Absolutely. And the number of women in an age cohort 
also affects the, the future population growth as China is finding now with its um, the, the, the longstanding uh, female infanticide policy that they had. They no, no longer have enough women giving birth uh, to keep their population growing. Uh, we, now, we, are, we have reached the end uh, of, of our time, uh, unfortunately. We have. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to close this here. Thank you uh, to the panelists for some uh, phenomenal insights. This is only touching the surface. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, people should note that we have two more of these webinars coming. And there is a yes, lot more to cover. Like, the next event, Quentin. <laughs> so, yes, um, you know, we, we are going into a lot more detail. Um, so please come to those subsequent events as well. They will, uh, they've already got a lot of people signed up, but there will be promotion of them through CIPR social media channels. So and thanks to everyone. And thanks, of course, to uh, th those who came along, especially those who asked questions. So great. It's, it's been phenomenal to keep this this conversation going. Thank you, Quentin. Thank Thanks you. Thank you.